Hello again, as you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and today we are going to be talking about cloud-based surveillance cameras. These are really, really cool modern technology devices that really get a bad rap. These are one of those things that is awesome and is amazing and it's cool and almost everybody should use them, but people get a little scared of them and get worried about how they're actually gonna be used and all that kind of stuff. And so they get a, a bit of a bad rap and people think, oh, I'm just gonna use a normal surveillance system and, and don't even think about these things when they really should. So what are we talking talking about when we're talking about cloud-based uh, surveillance cameras. Essentially what we're talking about is that there is no local DVR or NVR. So whenever you set up a normal uh, digital surveillance system, you know, uh, using a Siamese cable or such, basically coax cable, that goes back to what is called a DVR or a digital video recorder, generally some kind of PC-based system. So you have up to 16 cameras, all connect back to that central DVR, which is a computer, and then that computer provides whatever services it provides. So it'll record uh, video, it'll send out uh, alerts or notifications, it may be its own web server so people can then connect into that DVR in order to see what's going on with the cameras. There's also something called an NVR, a network video recorder, and what network video recorders are is they're basically the same thing as a DVR, only for IP-based cameras. So you, you go out, you grab some, some network-capable surveillance cameras, you plug them in throughout your facility, and essentially an NVR pulls the video feeds from those IP cameras and then again provide services. So what you have to realize is that in normal digital surveillance setups, uh, the camera is relatively stupid. Uh, all it is, is is pretty much pr providing the video feed that goes back to that, that central local uh, video recorder, DVR or NVR, and then you access that over the internet somehow in order to get all of your services. So when we start talking about cloud-based surveillance cameras, Essentially, all this is, is you don't have the local system present. So what happens is you have your normal camera here. Instead of connecting to a local system, this connects to a system up on the cloud, and the, the system up on the cloud provides all the services. It provides the recording services, it provides the notification services, it provides all of that kind of intelligence. So what you can do is you can set up all these little cameras all over the place. They communicate up with the cloud server, and that's all you need. You don't have to worry about opening ports locally. You don't have to worry about the security or update of your NVR or your DVR. Basically, you just set up these cameras and away you go. Now, there's a lot of these cameras coming out now. This this is a camera from a company called Simply Cam. They sent me this thing to play with, and so I decided to. There's also cameras from companies such as Dropcam. So this is becoming a new thing and is pretty cool. Now, if you're going to be looking at setting up any of these, um, cloud-based security cameras, one of the biggest things you have to remember is that they are pumping out video almost constantly, which means you need a good upload connection. So when you, you when you initially configure the Simply Cam, it tells you that you need at least a 1.8 megabit per second upload speed in order for these things to work. Now, most of these guys do not have any local storage at all. So if the internet connection fails, they will no longer be recording video. So that is a bad thing. And that is one of those things that you do have to keep in mind. So, you know, whenever you're Whenever you're looking at installing surveillance cameras, again, it's it's all situational. Why are you installing surveillance camera? Because people don't like to think about it, but there's a lot of different reasons you install surveillance cameras. Sometimes you install surveillance cameras because you're worried about burglars or robbers or some kind of violent crime. Let me tell you, if you're worried about violent crime, stay the hell away from this. No. Say no to cloud-based surveillance cameras for violent crime. If you're worried about violent crime, don't buy this. Don't. No. Why? Because the issue is, is there, there's too many points of failure. If there is a power outage, obviously this thing fails. If somebody cuts the internet connection, this thing fails. If you're using Comcast and Comcast is just acting flaky that day, well, guess what? You know, your, your assistant manager gets raped and murdered right in front of a camera, but your internet connection isn't working, so it doesn't get recorded. So if... If you're worried about violent crime, do not buy these things. There are too many points of failure on this. But again, 
what most people don't like to admit to, is that's usually not why people buy surveillance equipment. Realistically, surveillance equipment is generally not uh, purchased for the concern of violent crime. It is generally purchased to make sure your employees are doing what the hell they're supposed to do. Again, if you think about employees, employees cost a lot of money. Uh, you know, even a $10 an hour employee, uh, you add in benefits and workman's comp and all that kind of stuff, costs, you know, well over $100 per day. You got five of those. $500 per day, and a lot of times you don't exactly know what the hell they're doing. So if you set up a nice little surveillance camera just to keep track of them, it is a very easy way to keep track of what's going on with your employees and make sure they're doing whatever they're supposed to do. You know, they know they have a surveillance camera watching them, so they'll sit there and they'll flip burgers or they'll take care of kids or they'll do all the stuff. I mean, one of the, the realities in the modern world is, is knowing that you are observed has proven, as I've talked about with police officers lately, that when you know you are observed, you're most more likely to do what it is you're supposed to do. And so that's where these little guys can be very, very useful. So with this little guy right here, right, when you have a cloud-based uh, surveillance camera, it does not require very much to set up. Uh, basically, you need the service, the cloud-based service, uh, from whatever provider. So this comes from a provider called Closeli. Uh, then you need the camera, so the Simply Cam. Essentially with this, after that, all you need is to plug this thing into power and then it connects to your wireless network using Wi-Fi. So all I need for this thing to work is what I have in my hand. So this is connected back to a, a, a power outlet and that's it. So uh, if I'm just a pretty normal, normal person, uh, normal manager or whatever, and I wanna set up a surveillance camera, I can go out, I can buy one of these, I can set this up in five minutes and now I have something that is very useful useful. So that is one of those things to think about. You know, again, like I say, with surveillance cameras, this is the important thing to remember. Um, I've installed a lot of surveillance cameras over the years, and that that's the thing, is you really have to think, what are you going to be using your surveillance camera for? Again, things like violent crime, to prevent crime, to uh, to be able to use something in court, stay away from these. Uh, on the other hand, again, like I say, just, just dealing with basic uh, employee management issues, these are really great. Now, beyond uh, the simple issue of being able to give you uh, the video feed, there are some other options whenever you're looking at these cloud-based uh, video cameras. Now, the first thing that you have to look at is how long do you want the video recorded for or do you want the video recorded? So most of the time when you're dealing with these cloud-based cameras, uh, they don't have any internal storage at all. Again, that's a problem if your internet connection gets cut. Uh, it's not recording locally. It doesn't have an 8 gig card in here or a 100 gig card in here or any card in here. If this isn't talking with a server up on the cloud, nothing is getting recorded. So that is one thing to keep in mind. So basically all this stuff gets pumped up to the cloud, but since it gets pumped up to the cloud and it is now a service, guess what? You get charged for services. So whether you're dealing with Dropcam or Simply Cam or a company like that, basically they have different plans uh, for how long to keep the recorded video. Is it for a day? Is it for seven days? Is it 21 days? Is it 30 days? And then they charge you per camera. So that is one thing that you have to think about whenever you're, you're buying these kinds of setups is you're going to pay per camera for however long you need the video recorded for. So for most businesses, uh, if you're going to be supervising employees, you say, I want this camera to record for one day. Uh, if you go with Simply Cam, it's like $50 for a year of that. And there we go. That's the bill. But if you start saying, well, I need five cameras to record for seven days, you then have to go in and see what all those price points is. And so that is one of the little gotchas about all of this cloud-based stuff. And whenever you're using cloud-based systems, you have to be careful of these service charges. You guys aren't thinking about this enough. Like Meraki. A lot of people have asked me, like, what do you think about Meraki? So Meraki is this cloud-based networking equipment from Cisco. Awesome equipment, as far as I can tell. The issue that I have is it costs $150 per year per access point for the cloud-based service. Whenever you're dealing with cloud-based services, you have to go and take a look at how much it is going to cost you because it can get expensive. Now, beyond uh, things like how long you can record for, uh, you also have other functions. Like what I like about this one is you can have two-way communication. I think you can have that with Dropcam too, where this has a speaker in it. So I can actually talk to you from somewhere else using this camera and it also has a microphone so you can talk back so you can actually have 
full communication. Why that's really useful is because with these cloud-based systems, not only uh, can you use a computer in order to, to mess with the cameras, but you can actually deal with the cameras from your smartphone. So I have used my little Galaxy S4 here from a gas station to fully interact with this camera. And over a simple LTE connection, I can see the video feed, I can talk to the person on the other side, it can do all that kind of thing. So again, we start thinking about like employee management. I set this up to watch my employees at the pizza shop. They're screwing around. I can pull this up and go, hey guys, stop screwing around. And they go, sorry boss, sorry boss, we'll stop screwing around, right? That's the kind of cool thing uh, that you can do. So the first thing, let's go over to the computer so I can show you the computer screen on this. And again, give you an idea of how this works. So let's go over here to the computer. And so basically uh, what you need to do is you need to set up a, uh, if you're, you know, if you're gonna be using these cloud-based cameras, you need to set up your account on whatever service you're going to use. So this is the account that I've set up on this Closeli service for Simply Cam. Then from here, you can have different cameras. So I, I only have one camera, but I could have multiple cameras. So if I had multiple cameras, I could go to different cameras and see what's going on with each dif different camera. Uh, like I say, I only have this particular one. And so right now, this is showing a live feed from this camera. And this is what's impressive about these modern surveillance cameras, these cloud-based surveillance cameras, is what you have to realize is this is live, right? So here, so it is that quick. So literally the video is going from this camera all the way up to the cloud being processed. I'm able to connect to their server and watch the outputted video. And I mean, the lag is just, okay, let me, oh, here we go. So, I mean, what, what, what was that lag there? I mean, that lag was, that lag was, I don't know, like two seconds. So that, that is one of the amazing things whenever we're dealing with this kind of technology. Now, in order to deal with the, uh, to actually go back and take a look at what's going on the camera, you know, we can just scroll back. This is one thing you'll have to play with, you know, with whatever camera you decide to go through, is remember the user interface for these types of things is very important. Uh, you know, a lot of people are worried about the quality of the equipment. Does the equipment feel feel solid. You know, they, they're really worried about the physical device. And unfortunately, a lot of times they simply are not worried about the quality of the user interface. So whenever you're going to be uh, dealing with any of these systems, you have to deal with the, the quality of the user interface. And here, like I say, this is pretty good. Um, now, if I want to like do full screen on this, I could open up the full screen and I can shrink, but you basically get the idea of, of what's going on here. And uh, it's a pretty good thing overall. Like I say, I, I really like uh, the simply cam thing. Now, once you get past the uh, that, so you're like, okay, well, that's a webcam thing. But Eli, this is 2014. What about our smartphone? What I really like uh, is with the smartphones now, they can do things like notifications. So this little camera here can do things like detect faces and detect motion. It will then alert you that it's detected a face or motion through the app, and then you can click on the notification on the app to see what's going on. So let's go over to my little demo table so I can show you this. So again, this is my little Galaxy S4. You guys are, are used to at this point. It's all cracked and messy. Uh, install later. Uh, yeah, okay. Ah, install later. Okay, there. Yeah, 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 whatever. Okay, so we got my little thing. And then up here, we can see that there's different alerts. And so basically, I get an alert from the, the Simply Cam whenever it notices a motion or any of that. So I can scroll down here. And here's a notification event summary. So I can click on this. And what happens is this opens up the uh, the camera to the point where it started noticing the motion. So what's really nice with this is not only does that notification open up the uh, open up the app, but it brings it to the first point where it notices the motion, so you know what's going on. Now with this, it's very easy to use. I can just scroll ahead um, and very easily see what's happening here. So you can see I'm, I'm at my desk here, and then we'll go up here, and we can see what's going on here. And we can basically just scroll through all of this very quickly and very easily. What's nice in the modern world too, is I can use this using an LTE connection and it works about as easily as this. I mean, it really, I have been surprised with how smooth all of this works in the normal world. So I can just scroll back, I can see, you know, what's going on, just 
that easily. You know, I don't have to plug in specific time codes. I can just scroll and see what's happening. And as you can see, I'm a pretty boring person up in my office. So we can just do that. And uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, not much. I just sit at my desk. But that's how easy it is. Now, again, beyond that, what I like is it has the microphone component. So if I scroll back and I go to the live. So now this is showing me what's going on live. And then I can actually talk using the two-way communication. So, hello. See, and it can actually, it can hear me. It can hear me. It can hear me. And, and so that that's coming through the microphone. Oops, <laughs> on the camera, and then I can speak to the camera. Hello using that. So this is the kind of cool. So all of that functionality you now have in something as easy as, as a little mobile app, which is really awesome. So that's what we're looking at when we're looking at these cloud-based cameras. Basically, Think of these, these cloud-based cameras. Don't think of them as surveillance cameras, right? Whenever we look at stuff like this, uh, people, people have a habit of categorizing things improperly. It's like, I don't want to use that as a surveillance camera. And you're right, as a surveillance camera, again, in order to send somebody to jail or use it as evidence or anything like that, this is a pretty bad idea. Think of it more as a telepresence device, a very, very simple telepresence device. So telepresence, normally you think about telepresence robots and all that kind of stuff. Think of this as more of a telepresence device. So you put this in some central area in your house, you put this in some central area in your business, and it's a way for you to keep track of what's going on and communicate with people in a very easy to use interface. Now again, like I say, a lot of you guys are gonna bitch whine and moan about the idea of spending you know, $50 a year on recording fees or all the way up to like $250 a year if you pay for the 21 day service. But you also do have to realize how much geek get paid to do what we do. When I used to install surveillance systems, there was a lot of profit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know when I used to talk about, you know, making thousands of dollars in profit before lunch? Um, yes, that wasn't a joke. Um, and so that's one of the things you have to look at is, you know, so if you have a professional surveillance system installer come out to your place and install a four camera system, let's say that's going to cost you three or four thousand dollars, much of which is profit, which is a beautiful thing for us. On the other hand, you can go out, you can buy this for $150, plus even if you buy the 21-day recording plan, uh, you know, that's $250. So for $400 in the first year, you can buy one of these. Uh, you know, the, the, the price, depending on what you need, isn't so bad. If you only need two cameras installed, you know, all told, this thing isn't going to cost very much money compared to a full-fledged uh, surveillance system that would cost a lot of money. So that's one of the things to think about. And then, again, you don't have to, pay, you don't have to hire geeks to deal with all this equipment all that. So, so there you go. Now there is some worry. People say, well, what about hackers, Eli? What about hackers? What about if hackers get into your system and then they somehow do whatever, right? So somebody goes to closeelli.com, they hack my Eli the Computer Guy account, and then they can see everything happening in my office. And what I would say is, yes, there is a potential that can happen. That, that is a very real that's a real possibility, right? Especially if you don't use a lot of different usernames and passwords, or if you share the username and password, so on and so forth. What I would really argue though, the question that I would have is, are you really doing anything that bad in your environment? Um, here's the deal. I would not put this in my bedroom. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like, this is not going to go in my bedroom because I don't want to worry about somebody hacking uh, the system and seeing what goes on in my bedroom. On the other hand, uh, you know, I guess I'm 38 now, so I'm not as freaky as I used to be. I wouldn't actually mind that much putting this in my living room, even if it got hacked. Because what the hell is it going to see? It's going to see me and my wife drinking bed by, bedtime tea and watching Doctor Who. It doesn't really matter. Like, everybody's so worried about privacy. I mean, that, that's your business. But one of the things you have to think about is even if somebody compromises the system, what in fact are they actually going to see? If you put this into a gas station or if you put this into like an office environment and even if somebody hacks it, does it really matter? <laughs> 
You know what I'm saying? Does it re- I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail after this, but seriously, does it really matter? Um, and again, that, that's the decision that you yourself will have to make. The other point that I will make with that, though, is, is again, one issue uh, where people get a little confused is they say, well, Eli, this is a cloud-based system, so this can be hacked. So I want to use a normal NVR or DVR for my security because that can't be hacked. But we have to realize is that if that NVR or DVR has any web component that allows you to remotely access the system, then in fact it itself is on the internet and can be hacked just like this little guy can. So a lot of people have this feeling like, if I, if I own the server, if I own the NVR or DVR, that somehow fundamentally makes it more secure, when in a lot of ways it doesn't. In a lot of ways, owning your own equipment uh, creates a lot more security holes because you don't update it properly, you screw around with usernames and security and passwords and all that kind of stuff. And then when they compromise that system, they didn't compromise one camera, they compromised all 16 cameras you have up in your facility. So that would be the thing that I would think about. One of the big things, I mean, the question that really does come up whenever you're dealing with any of these cameras or surveillance systems is again look at the situation you're dealing with in order to figure out what you really need. I would never ever ever use this in an environment I ever thought there was going to be any kind of violent encounter in. I would not use this in a gas station ever, right? It's just not what it's built for. Um, the same thing is true like I say with being a cloud-based surveillance system. I would not put this in my bedroom ever. <laughs> Because it might get hacked. I just don't want to deal with that. You have to think about the situation and pick the right device for the job. But again, that holds through with no matter what you do in IT or technology. Uh, FCC compliance, again, Simply Cam actually sent me one of these and gave me one of these things for free. Uh, it's pretty useful, pretty nice. Um, again, I would say take a look at this. We're about to do a review of this in a second. Uh, but otherwise, if you're looking for other cloud-based systems, uh, Dropcam is the big name um, in, in the cloud-based surveillance camera network, uh, camera community, uh, but it works basically under about the same premise. So, you know, again, depending on what you need, uh, cloud-based surveillance cameras are really good. I, I would argue these are more of telepresence units than anything else, and I think if you treat them as such, um, I think you'll get the best results. Altero.com, A-L-T-A-R-O.com. If you're dealing with virtualization in a Hyper-V environment, so we're talking about Windows Server 2008 R2, 2012, and 2012 R2, take a look at Altero.com. They have a number of Hyper-V backup solutions. They have the free version, which will back up up to two VMs for free forever. They also have the unlimited version, starting at only $400 per host. I think this is a very good value. So if you are dealing with Hyper-V virtualization and you need a backup solution, take a look at altero.com. Adaccess.com. If you're dealing with Active Directory on a large scale, so you have hundreds of users to add, hundreds of users to disable, so on and so forth, you may want to take a look at adaccess.com. This is Active Directory management and automation software. So this tries to automate and simplify the Active Directory workflow. So if you are in a large scale Active Directory infrastructure, take a look at adaccess.com. Plixer.com. Plixer deals with NetFlow analytics software. So NetFlow is a component of Cisco equipment that shows you what's going on at the network layer, what devices are talking to what other devices, what kind of network jitter, all of that kind of stuff. So Plixer has a free piece of software called Scrutinizer. Scrutinizer is a free NetFlow network traffic analysis tool. So if you want to play around with NetFlow, if you want to see what's going on with the network layer and you have Cisco equipment, take a look at Plixer.com. Click on the link below this video. It'll bring you to this page where you can download Scrutinizer, the free NetFlow network traffic analyst analysis tool. SchoolyMitchell.com. If you're trying to find better internet or telephone service, or if you're trying to find less expensive internet or telephone service, give Schooly Mitchell a call. Basically what these guys are, these guys are telecom consultants. You call them, you say what you need for yourself or your client, and they figure out the best option. They'll examine your existing services and review your bills to make sure there are no errors. Then they'll keep an eye on your services moving forward so that everything remains optimized. Because Schooly Mitchell is objective and independent, they have no ties to vendors. 
vendors. You know they are always your best interests in mind. The best part is there is no fee for their services. The only cost is a portion of the shared savings over a set period of time. If they don't find savings, there is no cost to you. Schooly Mitchell. Is managing users and computers on Active Directory too cumbersome? Download SolarWinds Terrific Trio of free Active Directory admin tools today and start saving time on those Active Directory management tasks. These free tools help you manage and remove computers and users from Active Directory and allow you to add users in bulk. The free tools uh, include inactive user account removal tool enables you to scan Active Directory and optionally remove users who have not logged in for a certain amount of time. Inactive computer account removal tool enables you to scan Active Active Directory and optionally remove computers that are over a certain number of days old and user import tool saves time by giving you the ability to create users in bulk using a CSV file. You can even specify the attributes. Also be sure to check out SolarWinds community page thwack.com to connect with more than 100,000 IT professionals. So take a look at solarwinds.com for their free and other tools. Nerdswecanfixthat.com. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company but you don't want to have to worry about coming up with a logo and copyright and trademark and all of those kinds of things, you may think about buying into a computer services franchise system. Nerds We Can Fix That is a computer services franchise system. They have 62 franchises throughout the United States. They can franchise in every state other than Hawaii. They also franchise internationally. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, you should contact them, fill out the information below, or give them a call. Again, as I will say, franchise systems are great for a lot of people, not so good for others. Always make sure to do your due diligence, but if you're thinking about starting a computer services company anyway, you might as well contact Nerds We Can Fix That to see what they have to say. Veeam.com, V-E-E-A-M.com. If you just virtualized 100 servers and now you're trying to figure out how to back them up, they have solutions for ESXi, they have solutions for Hyper-V, and as you guys like, they have free stuff. So if you are dealing with a virtualized environment and you're trying to figure out a backup solution, take a look at Veeam.com. Spiceworks.com. These guys have the free network management software, the free mobile device management software, the free community with millions of users. So if you need, if you're an IT professional and you need support, Spiceworks is a great place to go. All of their stuff is basically free and just an absolutely great thing. Again, if you have any questions that I don't answer in the show that are technical in nature, you know, we're talking about Active Directory synchronization between sites in remote areas. Uh, if you click on the link below this video, that will take you to the Spiceworks community. They have millions of users there that will be able to help you out. So take a look at Spiceworks.com. So today's hands-on review is the SimpliCam. So this is what I was demonstrating in the class today, and SimpliCam, you know, sent me one of these just to play around with. And I have to say that this is a pretty good cloud-based camera, and is one of those things that you should definitely take a look at if you need a basic type of surveillance system. So you know, a lot of people think about like when they're going to install surveillance systems for companies or homes. You know, they think about surveillance systems like 16 camera systems and eight camera systems systems and all that kind of stuff when in reality many times all you need is a single camera and this little single camera actually does a really good job very easy to set up looks pretty good and overall is a pretty good device now let's go over to my table just so I can show you what's going on with this little simply cam so you can get an idea so this is the simply cam itself and again it's pretty small so this this obviously is my hand and so you can fold it down and it becomes uh, relatively small uh, normally what you do is you set this up on a desk or some kind of flat area and then you can kind of aim the camera as so. Uh, or if you want to mount this thing to a wall, this is the wall mount, you screw this thing to the wall and then you connect uh, the, the, the base to this wall mount and then like I say you put the camera up however you want. Uh, as far as being built, uh, generally the build quality on it seems to be very good. It has a nice finished metal. The only issue that I would really complain about uh, with the Simply Cam as far as build quality is how lightweight this particular base is. So if, if you get a feel for this camera, it, it, it has a different, de de decent weight to it, but most of the weight is up here in the actual camera itself. Very little weight is down here in the uh, in this this footer, and so the issue is is if you're going to start like pointing this this camera, so 
it, it changes the center of gravity, it starts to pull up the, uh, the base and amount, and you don't feel like it's really stable, especially how they have this set up where you're supposed to run the cable underneath. It just, I mean, it doesn't feel like the camera is in a very stable position. It feels like if something gets tapped, all of a sudden the camera is moving around, and so now it's pointed at something you don't want it pointed at. If you want the camera pointed this way, and then something happens and, and the weight pulls it a different way, well, the camera is on. It is, in fact, recording. It's recording the wall, and so that is not very useful. But otherwise, seems to be a nice little device. Uh, one of the things I like is it is powered by a USB cable. So there's a little USB cable, micro USB, that plugs into the back, and then they give you a really, really, really long uh, uh, there we go, USB cable uh, to actually connect it into a power source. So that is a nice thing. So I guess that's probably about eight feet long. And so it allows you to be able to put the, uh, the camera at a different position. So some, some things I've seen, like they'll give you a, a short cable. What's nice with this is they give you a cable that's long enough you can put it into different places. Now if we go over to their... Um, to the computer, I can kind of show you what's going on on their website. So if you go to simplycam.com, you can take a look. You got all the different information. Basically, they say it's a 720p camera, uh, from what I can tell. It seems about right. If we go to buy one of these things, you can buy one for either $149 or $199. These are both the exact same thing. Uh, the difference is in the recording plan. So whenever you are going to go with one of these cloud-based cameras, do make sure you have to buy a recording plan if you want anything recorded. So a lot of them you can buy and you can live view for free, but if you want anything recorded, you know, it's, it's, you've got to buy that plan. If we go here, we can take a look. Um, let's see, 720p two-way talk, which is nice. I'll show you in a minute. They've got night vision. It's got infrared, 107-degree field of view, sound notifications, motion notifications, so on and so forth. That is one thing that is really cool I showed you in the class, but it's it, what's really awesome with this, uh, with the Simply Cam, is that it gives you notifications on the phone when it detects motion or when it detects faces, and will automatically take you there. So if you put this into your store, and at midnight it detects motion, and not only will it give you an alert, but you can actually click on that alert to see what's going on. So you get an alert at midnight, somebody's in your store, and you're like, oh no! call the police and then you click and then you see it's your idiot assistant manager who you know is, is taking somebody back to the store to bang you know what i'm saying yeah that's what happens in the real world so uh, so overall pretty good thing now again if we go over to uh their the closeli is the service that you use in order to do a live view of the camera we can see what's going on here uh so this is basically the the setup so we can we can very easily scroll through and see what's been recorded on the camera. Since playing with this thing, so I've been playing with this thing for about a week now, I do have to say it is very responsive. Uh, you just go and you click you click through uh, and you find what you want to look at and it's very nice. I mean literally this is almost as responsive as the old systems that actually used to be at your property. You know, So these are very nice. You go through and you click and you can see the different things going on. Um, overall pretty good thing. Uh, if we go over we can also take a look at the my plan uh, for the videos. Again this is where I'm talking about where you need to look at what the recording plan is and how much it costs. For a simply, uh, simply cam, you know, one day recording costs you fifty dollars per year. Eleven day recording costs you one hundred and thirty nine per year, and twenty one day recording costs you two hundred and twenty nine dollars per year. So do realize one of the things is that is a per camera fee. Um, they do supposedly give you a discount if you have multiple recording contracts. So your first can, like if you do a one day recording plan, the first plan would be fifty dollars per year, and that's supposed to be like forty percent off each year additional plan. So the second plan would be like $30 per year, so, you know, go on, so on and so forth. So you kind of have to figure out uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but overall, like I say, it seems to be a pretty good thing. What, what I really like about it is if we go back over to the demo table, is how well, oops, that's not the demo table, how well their mobile, can, uh, their mobile app works. So this is the Closelli mobile app. Oops, and of course it's screwing with me now. 
and it just works very, very easily. Um, so again, I've been playing around with this using my LTE, using my mobile internet connection, and one of the things I've been surprised with is just simply how good uh, the quality has been. Uh, so right now, it's showing live video. I can just simply scroll back, and it very easily will scroll back and show me what was going on in previous times. And again, I mean, it's, it's literally, it's that smooth and that simple. And it is this smooth and this simple, even again, like I say, when you're on LTE or 3G connection. So you can go through, and you can just take a look at what's going on, and go, oh, look, this is what was happening at... Uh, at one o'clock, uh, one thirty-four yesterday. So it's it's very easy, very smooth uh, to use. Beyond that, what you can do is if you go to real time, one of the things I like is it has a two-way communication. So if I press on this microphone here, I can I can talk to whoever's on the other side. So I can press this, then it says hold to talk. Hello. Can you get that? Hi ha 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 hi. Oops. So that is a really nice thing. So you can set this up uh, somewhere, and then when you get an alert and somebody like walks in the door or walks by it, you can say, hey, who the hell are you? And then they can respond, and uh, so it's listening to me now. See? And so that way you can have two-way communication um, using just a simple camera. So this, this little thing really can replace like a security guard or any of that. So it's overall, it's, it's a very nice thing. You know, at the $150 price point, um, I think it's a good deal. I mean, at least for like, yeah, I think it's a pretty good deal. I mean, it, you know, if you're going to be installing like 10 cameras, no, don't buy them. <laughs> you know, is it? No. Uh, if you're going to be installing five cameras, it's it's close uh, but if you're if you're below five cameras if you're gonna install one two three four cameras and you want that that mobile to, to be able to access the cameras um, it's a good thing I, I, I don't really see any downside to it overall uh, it really like I say it does seem to work pretty seamless haven't had a lot of issues uh, the only issue that I have really had is for the Mac setup routine uh, when you plug this thing into a Mac it gives you a little double click thing you're supposed to double click and set up uh, and that failed that failed so I actually had to go to Closeli uh, and set up the account manually uh, but once I did that it was like dirt simple pretty easy um, and then otherwise I say in about a week of using this thing I really can't see, I, I really haven't had any major problems with it. Again, the only, even the, the only even design difference, I would say, is just this, this piece of metal here really does need to be heavier because it's just so easy to, to actually twist this or turn this or move it in a different direction. Otherwise, the resolution is good, the communication is good, using the cell phone app, because um, that was one of the... <laughs> I, I set up the notification level too high, and so I was I was getting notified all the time uh, using it. But it was really interesting. It really, is. you know, I could be in a gas station somewhere, and I would get a notification, and I would click on it, and I would see exactly, you know, some little corgi corgi face sniffing the camera. So there's really. Yeah, it's a really, really good thing. So, uh, so take a look at Simply Cam again. FCC compliance. Basically, they just gave me one of these things to play with. Uh, but I like it. I like it. Um, compared to Drop Cam, I, I don't, I don't know. I haven't played with Drop Cam honestly. Uh, but, uh, but Simply Cam. It's, it's a good thing. And like I say, at, at 150 bucks and their, their price point for recorded video, um, I think it's a good deal. Again, like I say, all the way up to about four cameras. Once you get four, four or five or more, there might be better options for you. But, but otherwise, well, it's a good thing. So this question comes from Ridwan D. I've been in the IT field for a little over 16 years, supporting computers and networks for companies. I'm at the point where i rather put the investment into my own business. My wife and I are starting our own IT support company. She is very business savvy, and I am the technical one. I would like to ask you what beginning steps should I take that will give me traction in starting this new endeavor? Well, well, well. So you're going to be going out there. You have 16 years experience in IT, so that's a good thing. So you actually know what the hell's going on in IT support, and you're going to go out and you're going to start a company with your wife. <laughs> 
Oh, boysies. Oh, boysies. Um, yeah, um, I would I would have you think about that a little bit to begin with, uh, to be honest with you. So I have actually worked with my wife in my past, and my wife is a great woman. She is very intelligent, and she is very smart, and she makes a lot of very good decisions. Um, and I would never work with her again. Uh, one thing that you do have to think about, you have to really think about uh, whenever you have a business, is do you really want to bring in your relations? And I would argue almost always the answer should be no. And the reason is, is because businesses are messy things. Businesses are just dirty, nasty, messy things uh, that somehow, hopefully, if you do everything kind of, sort of right, money pops out of, right? But the big thing that you have to understand whenever you're starting a business is that there is no right way. You guys always all want the way, the right way, the correct answer, all of that kind of horse crap that fundamentally doesn't exist. There is no right way to run a business. There is no perfect way to run a support uh, shop. You just kind of do it and hopefully you succeed more than you fail and therefore you come out with a profit and that is what you use to go off on vacations. And so why this is important is because when you get into businesses with people that you know, that you have a personal relationship with, Unfortunately, you bring in a lot of baggage into that business relationship, right? Because basically, if I was ever going to have a business partnership again, I would truly only want a business partnership. I wouldn't want to have beers with them. I wouldn't want to know their kids or their dogs or any of that horse crap because all of that is personal stuff. It's personal baggage that comes into uh, the, the business world and can make a mess of things. So what you're thinking, right, is okay, if I bring my wife in, uh, she'll be able to do all this paperwork and all this stuff and it'll be really great free labor, which will free me up to do all the technical things. What you're not thinking about is that when you guys are having a disagreement about whether you should buy a new server or use a hosted solution, that not only are you going to be having an argument about that particular server, but you're also going to be having an argument about the car you purchased three years ago or the house that she agreed for you, that, that you guys could buy but that she didn't actually want or this or that or the other thing or when you want something done that what's going through your mind is, you know, I said the kids couldn't have ice cream last night after dinner and she let me have let the kids have ice cream after dinner darn it I should be able to to say what I mean and so that's the issue that you get into with businesses, especially with your dealing with spouses. And you have to be very, very, very careful because there's all, again, there's all of this extra baggage that comes into it that can be very damaging for the business. Again, as far as a business is concerned, all it is is about profit and loss. It's about pushing out product or service to the end user in the most efficient manner. And so when you bring in all of this extra stuff, I mean, it can get really sticky really quick. Uh, so what I would say, from, from the get-go is that if you and your wife are going to work together, one, I would argue you should really think about that. You should really think long and hard. I, I understand the motivation. I get the motivation. And that's why I'm saying you should think really long and hard if this is something you want to do. And then I would say that you should write a contract. Uh, between both of you. And you're like, well, but, 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 but we're husband and wife. We don't need a contract. Ah, but you're still a human beings and, and human beings can get really nutty about things. And so if you write a contract stating what her roles are and what your roles are, it can make things a lot easier going into the future. So that's the first thing I would say is just be careful on that whole spousal thing. Past the spousal thing, again, if you're going to be starting a business, all it is really is going out and pounding the pavement. Get your flyers, get your business cards, go out to the business district in your, in your neck of the woods and simply knock on doors and hand out your information uh, and see and see who will who wants your service. And then when they do read about your service, uh, talk to them, see what they actually need and see what they actually want, uh, and then modify what you are going to provide. That's the other thing to think about whenever you're going to start in any kind of company, especially an IT company, is a lot of times uh, people have this idea. It's like, I am going to repair servers, or I am going to run a network cable, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. And the problem is, is that a lot of people need work done. They just don't need the work that you you want to provide? 
Uh, and so that's why you want to talk with people to see what they actually need. You know, you walk in and they say, well, you know, our server has been up and running for five years. I'm not really worried about it, but we do need a voice over IP system or, you know, something along those lines. Our computers are working fine, but we really do need a website. So you might be surprised uh, that the things that your potential clients want aren't necessarily the things that you were planning on selling. And so I would argue the most profitable thing is to figure out what the people want at the highest profit margin and go after that. That is the final thing I would say is always look at the profit margin. Again, one of the biggest problems I have talking with a lot of the viewer base out there is everybody's like, I want to do computer repair. It's like, yeah, but there's no profit margin in computer repair. There's that much profit margin in computer repair. You go out there, you repair computers, wow, you can make forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. Woohoo! Right? Um, that's like where you're maxing out. Uh, whereas if you do other things, again, things like digital surveillance systems, things like websites, things like web apps, maybe even look at things like mobile app development, for the exact same amount of work, you can make 100 200 500 a year um, for the same amount of work as if you were simply going out there and doing normal computer to repair. So that would be one of the things I would really think think about. I mean, it really is. It's like around here, if I was going to go back into the IT world actually doing hands-on stuff, I mean, it's not a joke. If you go out and you offer computer repair services, uh, you're competing against literally everybody. Nobody wants to pay any more than 25 or 35 bucks an hour. It is just completely tedious, horrible, nasty, going to rip your hair out just trying to find clients. On the other hand, if you go into something like mobile app development, um, it's ridiculous. <laughs> there is very little competition, and the amount of money you can make is just so outsized as to be just just foolish. I mean, like literally ten, twenty thousand dollars per week in profit type of deal uh, that people would be happy to pay for. Uh, so those would be some of the things that I would think about. But again, like I say, at the end of the day, really think about that whole wife thing, um, the spousal thing, because I know it seems really good on paper. Uh, but the difference between paper and reality can sometimes be a lot larger than you realize. So this question comes from Jeremy S. I am 14 years old and live in Malta. I have my Cisco IT Essentials. I got with a 94% at 9 years old. There you go, boys and girls. That is your competition going into the future. Get Cisco certified at nine years old, right? Uh, CCNA, half my MCSA work in progress and have done a couple college courses in web design, dev, and hacking. I am fluent in HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, and PHP. My preferred field is networking. I love network servers and uh, the sort. I've even scrounged, scrounged together a server room in my house with stuff I buy whenever I have some cash. Uh, I would love to work as a sysadmin network engineer when I finish high school in two years. Should I bother going for a university level degree or should I stick with short courses? Where should I take my life? <laughs> well, that final, that final question, I don't know. When I figure out what to do with my life, I'll tell you what you should do with your life. I would just leave that one off the table. Um, but the, the main question is, is, you know, it's a standard question of should I go to university or should I get to go certifications? The reason I'm answering this particular question on the show is it does come uh, with a the very curious, uh, basically specific uh, situation that this guy is dealing with. So he's 14 years old, got a CCNA, got half his MCSA, he knows HTML, he knows CSS, he knows JavaScript, he knows PHP. And then, I mean, you can legitimately can know all this stuff at 14. It's it's a stretch, but I mean, it is possible. Already playing around with doing some college level courses, as I've said, all you high schoolers, you can go out and do that too. So the question is, is, you know, this guy is coming out and saying, dude, man, I'd be smart. I'd be a 14 year old, man, I got this down. Should I even bother with university? Why the hell should I screw around with university if I'm obviously this smart? And here's the thing. Here's the trick with you, though. If you've actually got all this stuff at 14 years old and did that at 9 years old, and that really is true, what I would argue is, is that you are too smart to, in fact, skip university. 
So university is really good, right, for, for, for a couple of types of people. It's good for the pretty dumb people, to be honest with you. You know, you have these people that are basically pretty dumb. They're, they might be good at book work. They might be good at studying and passing tests. But otherwise, they're basically a rock. So you need to send them off to university or college just to get them useful enough that society cares about them, right? But then after you get past basically the, the dumb people, realistically, I mean, they're book smart people, but otherwise they're rocks, then you get to the next set of people that college is probably not good for, and that is the relatively smart individual. So relatively smart people are people that can pick up information on their own, they are disciplined, they are self-motivated, and they are going to do something with their lives almost no matter what, right? If they go to college, it'll be good. If they don't go to college, it'll be fine. Basically, these are people that can go, hey, I saw Facebook. You know what? I really don't like, you know, how Facebook is designed. I think I'm going to try to create the next Facebook. So for those people in the modern world, a lot of those people can skip university because, again, they're already smart. They're already motivated. They will be able to figure it out. So spending $50,000 or more and taking the time in university can be a bit of a questionable thing. If they don't know what they want to do in life, uh, then they should go to university just to figure out what the hell they want to do in life. But if they know, if they, if they come out of high school and they say, I want to do X, Y, or Z, then they can skip university and they should probably be fine. But then you come to the next set of people that should go to the university because it's really what the universities are supposed to be about. And those are the really smart people, right? Because you, you have to think about, you know, in the world of technology, um, you know, people like me, we sit here and we talk about the MCSEs and the MCSAs and the Cisco equipment and software-defined networking and all that kind of stuff. And what you have to realize is, however smart you, you believe I am, I, I'm actually not that smart. You know, like a lot of people say, Eli's not that smart. I go, I would agree. <laughs> I'm, in the, I'm in that middle group that should go to college, right? So, you know, I can go out there and I can play around with equipment that's already been developed, that's already been designed. I can show you the holes in the equipment that's already been developed, I can design. I, I, can, I can give you some tips and some pointers. But the reality is I can't really go out there and design or develop anything new. I can't really be on the true bleeding edge. The true bleeding edge of technology are the people that are developing this equipment. The true bleeding edge is all the boxes and all the devices and all the systems that have been developed over the years that don't even make it to market, right? You know, Cisco and Microsoft and Oracle and all these companies do a lot of designs and have full-fledged products that simply for whatever reason, they, they, they are in a market fit, so they never get to market. But there are people that actually develop and design that kind of stuff. And that really, I would argue, is where most geeks would like to be. Again, I'm not smart enough to be there, so whatever. And, but I would say, you know, if you are 14 years old and you have already done this stuff, I would argue, I think you're going to be happier going down that track. If you're already that smart, if you're already that smart, why, why accept the middling, right? Eh, middling's good for me because I'm kind of middling. I'm a middler that can talk really well, right? But if you're really that smart and you're really that motivated and you really want to push forward, why not be the guy that's helping to design Cisco equipment or helps design the next open source networking suite or something like that? In order to get to that level, you really do, it's wise to go to university. Technically, I suppose you could skip it, but going to university would be easiest. So if you go for the bachelor's degree program and then the master's degree program, and then you come out with your PhD. If you come out in IT or computer science with a PhD, you can do, and you know so much more than even somebody like I does, that I do, I do, I do, I does. Anyways, um, I would argue that is, that would be the route I would take. Again, if you're 14, I would argue try to start college now. Try to start college as soon as possible because, at least here in the United States, again, we have something called the GRE program. You can actually drop out of high school, take the GRE, which gives you the equivalent of a high school degree, go to college, actually complete college, then go for your master's and your PhD. You could literally... Even without being a smarty pants, even without being a Doogie Hauser or any of that, you have the possibility of having your PhD by 22, uh, maybe even earlier. Again, as I talk about, I got my bachelor's degree in two and a half years. 
uh, no lie. Uh, again, not because I was smart, just because I know how to work the system. Uh, because, like here in the U.S., what I did is I overloaded on classes. So every semester I took like 20 credit hours, and then I took the mini semester. Uh, like there's a there's a like a mini semester in the Christmas break, and I was able to take six credit hours there. And then during the summer, I think I took 18 credit hours. So doing that plus adding in some other things, I was literally able to graduate like normally. Again, not on the smart person track, just on the working the system in about two and a half years. So think about that. If you're 14 years old, you really bust your ass. Let's say you're 15 when you get into college. You could be 17, 17 something, especially push on for that master's degree. You could have your master's degree by 19. And then after that, it's riding out to however long it takes you to get your PhD. And again, simply working the system. This is not being brilliant. This is not taking advanced placement and all that kind of stuff. Simply working the system, you could come out with your PhD possibly by 22. And dude, <laughs> you come out with a decent PhD at 22 and the, the, what you are going to be able to do and the, the, the geek world you will be able to inhabit, it just has nothing to do with all of the stuff you're thinking about now. What I'm saying, it, it's just, it is entirely different world. So that's what I would argue. I would argue at your level, you'd be an idiot not to go for the university program. But again, don't go to university simply for the bachelor's degree. I would say you should target the PhD. And again, your early 20s, 21, 22, I bet you could get it done. As long as, again, you have the money. It's all about the money in the back pocket. Um, that, that would be my argument right there. So the final thoughts for today is that I'm pretty happy because the Eli the Computer Guy vlogging channel is actually starting to make a little bit of money. So this is my experimental channel. I have uh, off to the side. It has about 10,000 subscribers. Doesn't get very many views. It's kind of the place where I'm experimenting with different types of videos. Uh, one thing I've learned is if you're going to create a YouTube channel, what you should do is whatever your primary YouTube channel is, is you should find a format and stick with it. If there is one thing that I have found about YouTubers is that they like what they like and they don't like anything else, right? So if you have one main channel and you experiment with a lot of different things on that one main channel, expect to get a lot of nastiness, not just from the trolls, but from also people who like you who just want you to do something other than what you are in fact doing. So I came up with a vlog channel a while ago um, and it's kind of been on the back burners. I played with it for a while, then I let it drop and then played with it for a while and then let it drop. And then now I'm, I'm playing with it more and I'm trying to bring it more into the workflow of things that I normally do. So I, I do commentary on there. I do questions on there. I do other things. Basically, think about it as a vlog version of the Daily Blob. So remember the Daily Blob, you guys ask me questions and that kind of stuff. Basically, it's like a vlog version of that. So, you know, I've been playing around with it and uh, I just want to show you some of the stats so you guys can kind of have an idea of what you YouTube is like for most people because one of the problems is, is of course you know I talk about how much money I make off of YouTube on my main channel and then people think that's awesome that is what I am going to do but my success on my main channel isn't exactly normal you know uh, so I want to just go over to this vlog channel to give you guys an idea of kind of what it's like for most YouTube channels out there so we'll go into my computer basically I can't show you all of my stats but this is the, the, the revenue stat uh, uh, for this month, so this past 30 days. And you can see I'm very excited to be up to $52.63 for a whole 30 days. And this is the thing that you guys have to kind of realize about the YouTube world is this number right here is is more on par with what you can expect than than you know my my other number I could I guess you could say it's it's one of those things like making any money off of YouTube is rather easy making money that you can actually quit your day job is a bit of a pain in the ass so just to show you how things like curves work in the business world you can see down here this is where I wasn't playing around with my vlog channel very much before and I was making 33 cents and 19 cents and 67 cents uh, and then as I started doing more and more videos and actually paying attention to my my vlog channel you can see the money has gone up so you know, all the way up to five dollars and 14 cents for that one day so if we take this out you know if, if i'm making somewhere between four to five dollars per day that means right now i should be bringing in about 120 to about 150 dollars per month um and so you know that's a nice little bit of, of extra money to have and just kind of gives you an idea of what's going on
Uh, now, if I go over to my YouTube dashboard for this particular channel, just to kind of give you an idea of the stats, this is what I'm getting off of having about 83,000 views over here, less than 10,000 subscribers, so 9,763 subscribers, and you can see all this other stats, you know, 100,000 minutes watched and all of that kind of thing. So this is much more in line with what you can probably expect if you go into to playing around with YouTube. Yes, you will make some money. How much money you make, it's a bit difficult uh, to know. And uh, But, you know, as I say, it can be a very, very, very good business. Um, if, if you're actually successful at it. That is one thing that a lot of people don't realize with YouTube is that you can monetize multiple different channels uh, if you want to. You have to be careful about this because it does take a lot of time and effort to actually run multiple channels, but you can monetize multiple channels. So you can have your one main channel where you make you know however much money, then you can do a vlog channel, then you can do a review channel, then you can do another channel and another channel. You can have 10, 20 channels if you really wanted to, all uh, bringing in their own revenue streams. So that's just kind of one of those things to, to think about. So yeah, if you haven't been over there, uh, it's Eli Computer Guy Live. Um, you know, just throwing up lots of cheesy little videos. And uh, But I'm excited. Because what you have to understand, like when I look at a number like this, what, basically again, what you're looking for in the business world is you're looking for something called the curve. What you want to see is, is, is that you're getting growth, that it's going up. And so it was numbers that weren't a whole hell of a lot better than this uh, that I used when I, when I quit being a consultant and went straight to YouTube. Again, as I say, um, you know, $56 here, talking about $150 for the month, doesn't seem like a lot of money, but it was only about three years ago, those were the numbers for the Eli, the Computer Guy main channel. Again, you know, in September of that year, it was like $150, and it was $300, and it was $600, uh, and it really can go up uh, shockingly quick if, uh, if people actually like your content. So yeah, that's the vlog channel. Kind of excited about it. I guess we'll see where it goes.